Happy Sabbath, everyone. This morning, the subject that I'm going to present, in my opinion, is the most important truth or message in the Bible. And actually, it's not just my opinion. Those who know the truth, and they really understand and appreciate it, generally feel the very same way. To say that something is the most important truth or the most important message in the Word of God is a big claim. But as I delve into the subject, you will understand why. It is entitled, The Everlasting Gospel. The Everlasting Gospel. Many people give many different definitions for the gospel. Some say the gospel is the good news. Some say the gospel is Jesus saved. Some say the gospel is salvation through the blood of Christ. One thing you find in common with all of these definitions is that Jesus is in the center. In Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it says, in defining the word gospel, the message concerning Christ, the kingdom of God, and salvation. End of quote. Why is this message so important? So important that if we knew nothing else, we could be saved. I'm going to be reading quite a few references from the Bible for you this morning, so please take notes, because if it is indeed the most important subject or truth, then you need to know it. Starting with Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. Matthew 24, and we will read verse 14. And this is actually Christ's words. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Notice he didn't say the mark of the beast or the health reform message. He said the gospel of the kingdom That is the message he says must be preached into all the world before the end comes. So it's got to be very important. If that's what he says, everyone has to be exposed to before his return, then it must be vital to the salvation of all humanity. Again, we're looking in the Bible, but this time we are looking at Mark chapter 16. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. End of quote. Now you know in order... To be saved, Jesus is saying, the gospel has to come to you. But in addition to that, you must believe it. 
If you believe it, he says, you shall be saved. But if you do not believe it, he says, you shall be damned. In other words, lost or condemned to death. So the gospel, the everlasting gospel, in the view of God as expressed in Christ, is the final and the most important message for man to hear before he returns. And that is why it is so important. Notice he said, if you believe and are baptized, then you will be saved. For those who have the privilege or the opportunity to be baptized after they hear it and believe it, Sure, they will be saved. Those who may not have the opportunity, but they hear it and they believe it, the most important thing is that they have to believe it or have faith in what is revealed. Faith enough to apply whatever truth is revealed in the gospel message to their lives. If they just simply do that, the Lord Jesus is saying they shall be saved. The thief on the cross, uh, cross, unfortunately, did not have that opportunity to be baptized. But he believed, and he was given the assurance on that day that he would eventually be with the Lord in paradise. So, we know uh, the gospel is essential. There are no questions to go against such a fact. Look at the book of, of Mark now, Mark chapter 1, and it may be interesting to you how Jesus himself related to the gospel, even though it had to do with himself. Mark 1, and look at verse 14. Mark chapter 1 and verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So the Bible is revealing to us that even Jesus Christ himself preached the gospel. It's got to be important for even Christ to present it to humanity in his time. And after he gathered the twelve, notice what we are told in Luke chapter 9. Luke 9 and verse 2. As I said, you will need your Bibles to follow this because we want to make sure we grasp the importance and also what it really is when we talk of the gospel, since it is indeed proven to be essential. Luke 9 and look at verse 2. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So after Jesus got the disciples, the Bible tells us he sent them to preach what? The kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Well, what did they really preach? We were told they were sent to preach the kingdom of God. And look at what we are told in verse 6. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Isn't that interesting? Jesus told them to go and preach the kingdom. And when they went, they preached the gospel. What that reveals to us is that the gospel is directly related to the kingdom. 
there's a direct relationship between the gospel and the kingdom of God. For Jesus told them to go and preach the kingdom and to heal, and they went and preached the gospel and healed. So obviously they understood what he meant. They knew what the gospel was. And they knew that the gospel was directly connected to the kingdom truth. Hear what the spirit of prophecy says, Acts of the Apostles, page 27 and paragraph 1. Acts of the Apostles, page 27 and paragraph 1. Speaking of the disciples, we are told, they were to proclaim the gospel of peace and salvation through repentance and the power of the Savior. Did you get that? We were told, and I'm going to read what inspiration says, they were to proclaim the gospel of peace and salvation through repentance and the power of the Savior. So we were initially told that they were to preach the kingdom. We found out that the kingdom message that they were supposed to preach was the gospel. And inspiration is telling us that the gospel had to do with the power of the Savior. And that it required repentance before you could experience the power. So the gospel is all wrapped up with Jesus' power. And we are told that the disciples and Christ preached that message of salvation through the power of Christ. So since the gospel has to do with the kingdom or God's kingdom of righteousness, then it has certainly to be understood what is really meant by the kingdom of God. Luke 17, and we'll connect 20 and 21 together to get the complete flow. He says, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So this kingdom that Jesus was preaching about and calling on his disciples to preach about was not the earthly kingdom that the Jews were looking for. So this kingdom of God that the disciples went to preach about was actually the kingdom within, which means salvation within, which is only possible through the power of Christ or the righteousness of Christ within man. That is what it's all about. It has to do with salvation through Christ, Christ's righteousness, Christ's power in the human heart. For the carnal heart is enmity against God and therefore must be transformed by another power that takes possession of our mind. And as simple as that sounds, that is what it's all about. If I had to give a definition in terms of what is the gospel, I would not just say it is the good news. And I would not just say it is that Jesus saves. I will simply say the gospel of the kingdom is the good news that Jesus saves through righteousness by faith. I repeat, the gospel of the kingdom or the everlasting gospel is the good news 
that Jesus saves through righteousness by faith. You see, it becomes important for us to see that this truth is really the saving truth because you and I cannot save ourselves. But through the righteousness of Christ, through Christ coming inside of us and taking possession of our entire beings, the Father does not see our sinfulness or our fig leaf righteousness anymore. He sees Christ and his righteousness. And as a result, we are able to be acceptable in the sight of God. This message was preached from the beginning of time. If you recall, even in the Garden of Eden, after the fall of man, God revealed that he was going to send a seed re representing Christ in order to bruise the head of the serpent. That was the hope that was being given to our first parents from the very beginning of their fall from the grace of God that Christ was going to come to save them. They could not save themselves, and no one else could have saved them. They needed Jesus as their hope in order to be restored back to their Edenic experience. Abraham also, the Bible tells us, preached the gospel. If you look in your Bibles again, this time if you look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8, Galatians 3 and verse 8, look at what we are told. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. All of those who had messages from God always made the gospel a central theme in order for those of their age or of their time to be afforded the privilege of salvation. All. In Romans chapter 1, listen to what the Apostle Paul declared. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is the power of God unto salvation. But it is only possible to those who believe it. If you don't believe that you can be saved as a result of accepting Christ into your life, into your heart, by faith, that power is not going to save you. But if you do believe as a result of receiving him by faith, believing he does come to you, and you maintain that confidence in his abiding presence, and you maintain that trust in his ability to give you whatever you need in order to comply with the will of his Father, and salvation is afforded you. Once he abides in you, you are safe and you will be saved. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, the Bible says, they are the sons and daughters of God. So it is a need that the saints have to ensure that they possess Christ in their hearts, in their lives. For as the Apostle Paul said, it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. So again, if we had to describe it, it is simple. And it has to be simple. 
Too many people have come up in this world with all different ways of trying to gain salvation. Salvation by works versus salvation by faith. And it has created a lot of difficulties over the years. It has actually been one of the main challenges that the saints in the early Christian era had to face that led up to the Dark Ages. Because there were those Christians who were promoting salvation by works. That you had to comply with certain deeds. Sometimes those deeds were good deeds, but still, that was not what the gospel was all about. The gospel was strictly what Christ does for us, not what you do for yourself. Regardless of how good you may do certain things or certain good things you may do, it did not matter. That cannot save man. And wars have resulted because of a misunderstanding of this very important truth. Satan hates the gospel. He hates anyone to know that it is simply a matter of our having faith in Jesus in order to be saved. He fears we understand and appreciate it because he has cultivated a number of different religions who have produced religious exercises that involve works for salvation. It even was a problem with the Jewish nation in the time of Christ. For the scribes and Pharisees created their own commandments. Commandments of men, Jesus described them, in order for people to think that by so adhering to, they would gain salvation. But no, the gospel is indeed good news. That you and I don't have to try and save ourselves. Jesus saves. But how? Through righteousness. By faith. Yes, I could have added to this definition that Jesus says through the sacrifice or his death on Calvary's cross, and that would be right. Or I could have added his shed blood, and that would also be correct. Or I could have added his great love, and that would have been correct too. Or I could have added his saving grace, and that would have also been right. But in reality, these are all means to an end or very important elements of the plan of redemption. In other words, while they are all essential for salvation and without them eternal life could not be made possible, the truth of the matter is, no one can really take advantage of God's gift of eternal life via these different means or provisions without first repenting and then accepting the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, which is righteousness by faith. This is why Peter said that he, what he did on the day of Pentecost, remember what he declared? He said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. It is essential to, first of all, approach the Lord asking for forgiveness and expressing your sorrow for your wrong, thus clearing the way so that when you ask to receive the righteousness of Christ, it would not be that Jesus is coming in a dirty environment. We have to repent, and then we receive Christ, who in turn transforms or converts us through his own personal presence, his power, and his righteousness within. That is what every single human being needs to know. Every human being needs to have that experience. We were created to be instruments of God. We are 
temples for the Lord to dwell in. That is why he created all of us. And if we don't allow him to take possession of our temples, of our bodies, our minds, our hearts, then our purpose for being created by God is null and void. Think of a lifeguard. Someone is drowning out in the ocean and they're, they're struggling to keep their heads above the water. They cry out for help. Someone may hear them and they may notify the lifeguard if he didn't hear them. What does the lifeguard do? He goes out. He swims out to that individual. He makes his way to the individual and approaches the individual and that individual ends up recognizing that there is hope. But they are not yet saved until they are able to take a hold of that lifeguard. They may grab the lifeguard or they may allow the lifeguard to take a hold of them. It is essential if they don't know how to swim and they're having a difficulty that they put themselves totally at the mercy of the lifeguard. If the lifeguard does not come to them, they're in trouble. If the lifeguard does not reach out to them, they're in trouble. And if they in turn do not reach out to the lifeguard, uh, they will drown. Jesus is our lifeguard. We cry out for help. We cannot save ourselves. We are drowning. But it is essential. We have a part to play. We must accept him. Just as the victim in the water must accept that lifeguard. If he refuses to grab onto the lifeguard, he is going to drown. The same thing happens when you go on a cruise or a big ship and someone may fall overboard and you hear a man overboard. Those sailors, they have to find a way to get to that individual and often what they'll do, they'll throw out a lifeline and it may have some kind of a float or something at the end of it, but it is up to the individual to grab on to the lifeline and it is the sailor who pulls the individual in to the boat. You see, again, that life guard or the sailor in that particular instance is acting a role like Christ. He alone can help the individual, but the individual must take a hold of what he offers or else he will drown. You get in an accident and you're fortunate enough to have access to a phone, you call the dispatcher, the 911 dispatcher. The 911 dispatcher automatically contacts the police to come to your assistance, or maybe one of the traffic units to come and assist you. They become like a savior to you, but you have the responsibility of contacting them, of making that contact of making sure that you do your part in reaching out to them so that they in turn can do what is necessary to help you in your distress. Jesus is the lifesaver or the lifeguard. He is the sailor. He is the 911 dispatcher for our souls. If we do not reach out and take a hold of what he has to offer, we will be lost. And that is why it's not a matter of our works. It's not a matter of what we do. Our works are important. But first of all, our first step is in believing. We have to take a hold of what the Lord has extended to us of himself. Our works that follow afterwards only prove that we possess him. Notice what we are told in the book, of Acts. Let's open our Bibles 
in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, verse 20, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So we have to repent, but at the same time, the conversion takes place as a result of our sins being washed away or blotted out by the Son of God. We have to take a hold of what he offers, or we are doomed forever. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Notice what it is showing us. Our works even obeying the laws of God is not what saves us. We are justified by faith, the Bible says, without the deeds of the law. In other words, when I accept Jesus into my life, once he is by faith maintaining his presence in me as my Savior, I'm looking to him I'm depending on his righteousness. I'm depending upon his power in order to live a godly life. Should I die in that condition, never even having kept a Sabbath, but I die with Christ as my Savior, I will be saved. What will be the case if I live on and I have opportunity to keep the Sabbath, or I have the opportunity to obey the health message, or I have the opportunity to do good works, then through Christ abiding in me, if I am depending on him, on his power, to live in harmony with his will, then yes, Jesus gives me the ability to comply with his laws. But it's not my compliance that saves me. It is Christ that saves me. My compliance proves that the power of Christ abides in me. Notice verse 31 of the same chapter, Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Because we have Christ in us, abiding in us through the Holy Spirit, we are able now to obey the law in harmony with God's will. Because if I try to do the right thing without Christ abiding in me, it is insufficient to meet the standard of God's righteousness. It requires Christ working through me for my actions to be in harmony with perfection. Because humanly speaking, my motive even for doing the right thing would be wrong because my heart is carnal, sold on to sin. I will always do whatever I do for the wrong reason. But when Christ is in control of my mind, when he is the center of my life, my actions are perfected through him. So the salvation is not based upon my works. My works are only evidence or proof that Christ is in control or that Christ abides in me. Don't get it wrong, brothers and sisters. Don't put the cart before the horse. Don't put the works before the faith. Your faith takes a hold of Christ. He gives us the power. He is the one that gives us the righteousness that is acceptable unto God. And that is why even if I die without having an opportunity to do the works of righteousness, but I possess Christ, I will be saved. You will be saved. So make sure that Christ is 
your righteousness every day, every moment of every hour. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. Luke chapter 4. Let us look at verse 18 and 19. Jesus declared, and this is what he read in the Jewish temple and got into a whole lot of trouble for doing so, at least for responding in the way in which he did after he read this. He read from the book of Isaiah. Note, he declared, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So Jesus was revealing to us that the Holy Spirit came upon him so that he could preach the gospel. That's what we need to preach. We need people to know that Jesus saves through righteousness by faith. Not through their works, not through their making some kind of penance or indulgences, or because they may be doing a lot of literature evangelism, or going to and fro, feeding the sick, helping the poor. That is not what saves us, brothers and sisters. It is Jesus' abiding presence, and we have to have that clear in our minds. All these other good things are good in themselves, but we need to be doing them with Christ, abiding in us, manifesting himself through us, so that we will do it for the right reason and in the right way. Otherwise, we'll always be wrong, even though we may be doing the right thing. Do you know people who are wicked do good things for wrong reasons? It's not going to save us, no matter how good it is. It's not going to save them. So we need to make sure we understand the gospel truth. We need to understand what the everlasting gospel is. When God gave this message to man, it was in order to enable men, rich, poor, big, small, ugly, pretty, regardless of who they be, to be able to find salvation. The most unintelligent individual does not have to be lost because Christ has made the plan of salvation easy. Every human being, we are told in the Bible, is born with a measure of faith. You get inside of a taxi, you get into an aeroplane, you do things every single day that requires faith. You put your trust in people that you don't know, But that's how you are using your faith. Whether you are educated or uneducated, each of us have faith. And that is why it is possible for all to be saved. Because if they apply that measure of faith that has been allocated to them to Jesus, if they apply their trust and their confidence in his saving grace, in his saving power, in his ability to represent us before God, if they would only take a hold of his offer to come and live in their hearts, and they really believe that he does, with a little bit of faith that they have, they shall be saved. Doesn't matter whether they have a PhD or a nothing in education. As long as they have faith 
that he is their righteousness and he is their source of power to live in harmony with the, with the will of God, they will find salvation. That's why we say it is free. It is free to all who believe, but you have to believe. Because if you don't believe, you will not take a hold of it. And Jesus is not going to come and live inside of you if you do not believe that he does. All he's asking is to believe him. Believe his word. Believe what he said. And if we do believe that he does come and abide in us and he brings with himself inside of us, not just his power, but his own perfect righteousness, we will not consider ourselves to be dirty and unclean anymore because we are not looking at our physical or our human potential. We are looking at what Jesus is because then he becomes that to us. If he abides in us, we have it all. But we've got to believe. And the reason why many people end up being lost is because they find such a thought, such a truth, such a concept is too simple for salvation. Too simple. You've got to do something. We've, we've got to have something to do. Maybe say the way of the cross or the rosary or something. But it's not true, brothers and sisters. All the Lord asks us to do is to believe. Jesus told many of those who he healed in times past, only believe and ye shall see the glory of the Lord. Only believe. After we receive him, then we could go forward and try to do what we know is right. But as we do it, we depend on him with the confidence that he will help us. And that's why we end up having changed lives. Because with the power, the abiding power of Christ, you don't have to be saying, well, that's how I am, or, you know, I can't help it. No, Jesus is with you, is he not? If he is in you, the hope of glory, then why? Are you still falling victim to your carnal nature? Are you not allowing him to have preeminence in your life, over your eyes, over your tongue, over your fingers and your toes? Are you not allowing him to reveal his will and give you the power to do it? He always leaves it up to us to choose whether we will obey or not. But once we bring him in, he's going to tell us this is the way, walk in it, is up to us to comply. And once we do it, the righteousness we receive is maintained. That's what sanctification is all about. It is retaining justification. We become justified by faith when we receive Christ. He comes in us, and in the sight of the Father, we are justified. We are considered holy. To stay that way, the Spirit in us, He doesn't just come to sit down inside. He comes to help us, to lead us in the right path. And therefore, He tells us what we ought to do. He leads it up to us to choose. As we agree to do it, as we surrender our wills to his will, inspiration tells us he comes into us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So I agree. I choose what the Spirit is telling me to do because I've allowed him inside and now he's able to communicate the will of God to me. And I agree to fulfill the will of God in my life as he leads me moment by moment. I keep surrendering my will to him. Then after a while, through the power of the Spirit, he actually 
changes what I want. I begin to want to do His will, and I have the power to do it. But it starts with me receiving Him. How? By faith. And I can experience that every single day of my life. You and I are supposed to experience that every day of our life. Every single day of our lives, we need to be experiencing righteousness by faith. Don't step out of your house another day without being assured that Christ is in you, abiding in you. He is your righteousness. The everlasting gospel is good news. It is the good news that Jesus saves through righteousness by faith. Of course, as we have already seen, the salvation of itself has to do with what he has done by way of his sacrifice and his death on Calvary's cross, his resurrection, his ascension, his shedding of blood, his great love for us, his saving grace. But I have only the privilege of benefiting from all of these things as I manifest faith in his righteousness. Revelation 14, 6 and 7 Look at the message that God gave to Seventh-day Adventists. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. Just considering the first of the three angels for a moment. Verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having what? the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Who made the sea and the earth and the fountains of waters? The Bible tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him wasn't anything made. That was made. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, the Word, created all things. The Father carried out the work of creation through His dear Son, Jesus Christ. And our message is telling us that we are to call on people to worship Him that made everything. The everlasting gospel is centered around Christ. And that is what we are called to preach. We are to help people to see that they don't have to continue living a life of failure and folly and sin, that Jesus saves, that through him abiding in them by faith, they can be more than conquerors. We have the privilege of telling people that. Most people have no idea of how simple it is in order to live a true Christian life. But we continue sinning and sinning and sinning and falling deeper and deeper in love with the things of this world because we have a false concept of Jesus' rule in our lives. How could we continue living contrary to Christ but yet talking about Christ is my Savior. He's not your Savior if you are not being saved. If in the first place you continue sinning and sinning and living in the world, 
and falling in love with the things of the world, then Jesus is not in control of your life. He could not be, because the things of this world, the Bible says, are enmity with Christ. Enmity. But how could I kill that devil being in control of my heart? Replace him with Jesus. And it's so simple. Repent and be converted, we are told. Well, we ask the Lord to come into us, but we must first be willing to acknowledge that the wrongs we have done and the things that we love are contrary to his will. And we want him to change us. So we need his help. So we plead with him to come in. We ask. The Bible said, ask and ye shall receive. Do we really want to be saved? Or do we want to be accepted by others? It's simple. It's a choice. We want others to see us as being in with the things of this life. Or do we want to be in with the Lord? Abide in me, Jesus says and I will abide in you. It's a choice that we make. We either want him in or we don't. Many people who call themselves Christians will be lost. You know why? Because they never knew Christ. Jesus himself declares that, that how they will come to him and say, Lord, we did many wonderful things in your name, and he'll say, I never knew you, ye workers of iniquity. Never knew you. Why? Because he never was invited to come and live. I said live. I didn't say visit in your heart. Amen. We invite Jesus from time to time, and he does come because he really wants to live. This is what he created us for, to be temples for him to inhabit. But we quickly drive him away. It's like opening your front door to a friend and then slamming it in their face. We do it all the time. Every time we choose, contrary to his will, we chase him away. But if we would invite him and we ask him to please help us to get rid of the things that are contrary to his will, he will help us to fall in love with the things of righteousness and to hate the things of the world. We don't have to try and force ourselves to hate sin. Even that we don't have to do. He does it for us. He puts a love for truth and righteousness in our hearts. All we have to do is ask him, invite him within, and ask him to bring about the necessary changes. Focus on his righteousness, his power to save, not yours. Don't try to be holy. Let Jesus manifest his holiness in you, giving you the strength to walk in harmony with his holy will. Depend on him, not on yourself or your good deeds. Let those be an outgrowth or a fruit of his abiding presence. As I said before, do not put the cart before the horse. You know, in 1888, the Lord saw fit to send to his church this very same message, the message of righteousness by faith. Our church was in existence from the early 1800s. William Miller preached the first angel's message from about 1833. Right up to the time when Ellen White came, Jesus was still being viewed as the Savior coming to save mankind soon. It was believed he was supposed to come in October of 1844. So people were trying to get their lives right. And notice, 
What was supposed to be the message that was emphasized was the everlasting gospel. I believe to some extent, yes, Jesus was pointed to, but the emphasis of righteousness by faith did not really come home to the church until 1888. That is when Wagner and Jones brought the message of righteousness by faith. It's a very important message because at that time we were emphasizing more the law, the law, the Sabbath truth had taken a hold of us and we wanted everyone to know about the Sabbath. But God saw we needed, we ourselves needed righteousness by faith. So in 1888, he sent that message. And still, the majority of the leadership did not accept it. Did not accept it. And you know what inspiration said about that message that came in 1888? I want to read a statement for you. In volume 7 of the Bible Commentary, page 9, 84 and paragraph 6, volume 7 of Bible Commentary, 984 and paragraph 6. Listen to this statement. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is, listen carefully now, this is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. Did you get that? This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. If you go back and you read Revelation 18.1, you will see that it talks about a mighty angel that will fill the earth with its glory. Inspiration said the message of righteousness by faith that came in 1888 was the beginning of the light of that fourth angel, the angel of Revelation 18.1. It started to proclaim the most important message way back in 1888 and we did not take a hold of it. And yet that is the message that Jesus says is the everlasting gospel that has to be preached unto all nations before the end comes. Is it being preached today? Or are we still leaving it in an uncertain way that we aren't sure what the gospel is. Oh, Jesus saves. But tell me how. Don't just tell me Jesus saves. Tell me how. Because it's a message to save lives. Please, let's help people to understand the message. He saves us through his own righteousness if we will take a hold of it by faith. He shed his blood in order that we will get to that experience. He sacrificed himself on the cross so that we will get to that experience. He died and rose again to show victory so that we can get to that experience. Let's tell people how to get to that experience. God tried to help us to understand way back in 1888. We didn't get it. Have we got it yet? Then how can the everlasting gospel be preached unto all men? so that the end could come if those who were assigned to give the message did not get it yet in their own personal experiences. They didn't get it yet. Oh, I know that Jesus saves a long time ago. 
Really? Then are you living a victorious Christian life? That is why I say, brothers and sisters, that yes, there are many, many, many wonderful truths we can preach, and indeed all of them are important. We can talk about the coming crisis. We can talk about the wheat and the tears. We can talk about the 2300 days prophecy. We can boast over the fact that we know the true state of the dead. We, many beautiful truths. But I believe that the everlasting gospel, the good news, that Jesus saves through righteousness by faith is the most important truth or message in the Bible. And until God can get a people to understand it and see its value and experience it on a consistent basis, We haven't got it yet. And he has not yet got a people that he can truly depend on to proclaim his final message with power. You know, Martin Luther, in his introduction, written in 1538 in a commentary on St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians, uttered these words. So you wouldn't think I'm the only one that believes that it is the most important truth. Listen to what Martin Luther said. In my heart reigns this one article, faith in my dear Lord Christ. The beginning, middle, and end of whatever spiritual and divine thoughts I may have, whether by day or by night. End of quote. He experienced it. He came to understand and appreciate it to the extent that of all his thoughts, all his considerations, he got to a point, pray God that we will, that this was the beginning, the middle, and the end of all his considerations. Day and night. What about you and I? I want to close with 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And this time I want you to carefully listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. We just heard what Luther said. I want you to hear what Paul said. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ, and him crucified. Amen. Did you hear that? Anyone who studies the books of Paul, <laughs> there are theologians today that are still trying to unravel the thoughts that Paul had documented in the gospel. He wrote 
a number of different books that still baffle scholars today. His thoughts were so deep, so relevant, so profound that they are still debating over it after all these years. But yet, this brother, who was as eloquent as they come, who had been gifted by God, stood among the most educated in the religious world of his day, concluded that as he went forth as an evangelist to preach the gospel, he didn't want to depend on any other subject or any other ability in order to convey how much he knew and what he knew other than to promote Jesus Christ and his being crucified. In other words, he wanted people to know about the gospel. He wanted them to know that Jesus died to save them and how he can do it. And I'll tell you something, if you do a study on righteousness by faith from the very Bible, you'll be shocked to see how many times Paul took the, 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 the opportunity to explain to you the simplicity of righteousness by faith. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be taking the time to explain to people the simplicity of righteousness by faith because they think they know it simply because they have accepted Jesus. But unless you accept his righteousness by faith and you are depending on his abiding, saving power and what he has already done for you in order to feel safe and comfortable in your walk with God, then you will be a restless soul, not knowing whether you are saved or lost. And that is not what the gospel is all about. When you have the gospel, when you know it and you experience it, you are able to be at peace. For it is indeed as rightly stated, the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. May God help us to preach the everlasting gospel.